Well, amen and amen to that, my friends. Would you join your hearts with me as we pray and invite the Almighty God into our service this Sunday so that we can be blessed with His presence this morning? How about we pray? Almighty and holy Heavenly Father, You whom there are none like, of Yourself You brought forth the Son. Of Yourself You brought forth the Holy Spirit. Three in one. God, three in one God, we praise Thee and we worship Thee. Almighty God, we worship You and we adore Thee. We adore Thee, Jesus. We adore Thee, Holy Spirit. We adore Thee, Father. Almighty God, we praise You. And we just ask that You would send Your presence mediated by the blood of the cross to be with us this morning in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, welcome to our morning service. We have a few announcements for you, which Andy is going to bring. I'm going to remind you. He's going to remind you. It's Communion Sunday. So do get that ready. It's going to be such a pleasure to take it this morning. How about we give Andy the announcements? Andy? 
Good morning, friends. We hope you are having a blessed day and that this service is a blessing to you. We have two short announcements for you before we get into our service. First, this Sunday is a communion Sunday, so please prepare your emblems, your juice, your unleavened bread, or whatever appropriate substitute you have available. But most importantly, we prepare our hearts. Communion is a wonderful way to grow in our personal relationship with God. It is a command from the Lord, and obedience always brings blessing. Secondly, for the next two Sundays, we would like to inform you that an offering is being taken up for the support staff at UB Global that provide aid and comfort to our missionaries in the field. Serving in ministry is not just being the pastor behind the desk or a musician at a microphone, but there are many behind-the-scenes roles in the kingdom of God. If you would like to give financially to this, it is recommended that we give through our local church. Simply designate your offering to this cause by writing UB Thank Offering, and we will ensure that it gets there. Once again, simply designate your money by writing UB Global Thank Offering. We now would like to share this short one-minute video clip that gives us a glimpse into some of the work our offering would go to support. RUB missionaries experience victories on the field, and they also experience challenges too, like physical ailments, ministry difficulties, spiritual attacks, and COVID travel restrictions. This Thanksgiving, would you help us raise $35,000 to better care for and strengthen these overseas workers? Even this past year, the UB Global team has flown to accompany a hurting missionary, funded a new spiritual health training, and spent over 460 hours talking to and caring for our missionaries. Thank you for making a world of difference for those a world away. Our first reading of scripture comes from the book of Job, a selection of verses from chapter 28. The book of Job tells the story of a man who lost his children, his flocks, his herds, his servants, his wealth, his health, and his relationships. In the face of overwhelming loss, Job asks God one question, why? Throughout the book that bears his name, Job searches for an answer to this question and found that he was not wise enough to answer it, and the only person who could give him an answer was God. For only God was truly wise and able to answer the big why of life. In chapter 28 of the book of Job, we find these words where Job emphatically declares wisdom is not found on this earth. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? It is not found in the land of the living. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. Abaddon and death say we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. And he said to man, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. May we in humility come before the Almighty God, seeking answers from he who is the fountain of life and wisdom, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Guide me, O so great Jehovah, pilgrims whose esperen land. I am weak, but thou art mighty, hold me. Thy powerful hand, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain, wrench the healing stream come through. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength and cheer. Be my still my strength and cheer. I tread the 
village of Jordan bid my anxious fears subside. Bear me through the swelling current, lead me safe on Kenyan side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. I will ever give. Our second reading of scripture comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. The book of Proverbs, like Job, is often called wisdom literature. It is poetic, witty, direct, and prophetic all at the same time. The simplicity of wisdom often confronts us. It seems so easy. Is this truly wisdom? Throughout Proverbs, we are often told that wisdom is doing the right thing. And in truth, that is the hardest part, doing the right thing. When we have a relationship with God, the challenge is always to disentangle ourselves from ungodly pursuits and desires. Of necessity, doing good is turning away from evil. This passage encourages us to live a holy life by completely turning away from unholy choices and passing on. Our service continues with these words. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, may we always have the grace to pass on from bad choices. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word.
We are coming up, my friends, to that Thanksgiving season, and we got to give thanks to the Lord for our fantastic worship team, the people we've got contributing, Chris, Donna, Ruth, Heather, Jess, Herman. It's It's been exploding this year. It's such a blessing. Maybe we'll get a few more, a few more souls pulled into the worship ministry, and with everything, it's just been such a blessing. Andy, your family, Naomi, Rebecca, Lydia, Asher, all you guys do so fantastic. Thank you so much for all your helping out. It's simply wonderful. It makes these services, in my view, incredibly beautiful, and I really appreciate all the help everybody does. I am thankful for all the people who put the Shiloh Church service together. Thank you so much, guys. We appreciate you, and we appreciate you who are watching. Our members, people who are not members, people who are just watching. It's so good to be with you all through this COVID season, through this time. It's got, I get kind of sentimental around holidays. Like, I guess I'm a sensitive soul, but it's been, she's been a long haul that we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We have a lot to be thankful for. I was actually, I was talking with, um, it, was, it was someone at the health unit, and I was talking with them about COVID and just the toll it's taken. And I, I was saying, you know, at the end of the day, though, I find I can't complain too much. Like, I, I, I'm not going to thank God, <laughs> thank God for COVID, but... I feel blessed through it all because, you know, through the working at home, I got to see my children grow up in a very sensitive time in their lives. I got to spend so much time just being around them, interrupting things, but such a blessing. It is such an amazing blessing. I'm so thankful to God for that because apart from that, I wouldn't have had that privilege. And I think this year, and we can count many blessings. I think if we look, we can find, we can count many blessings. And that is an amazing place to start, especially when it comes to building a relationship with God. Thanksgiving is is a foundational facet, fact, basis, starting point of our relationship with God. And Thanksgiving has to be, it has to be pure. When you get the Christmas gift, when you get the present from someone you love, and you're just so happy that you got you something, you're happy before you even open the box. So pure thankfulness. Pure thankfulness. We want to have a heart of pure thanksgiving to God. And in this third message on our Building a Personal Relationship with God series, we started with the holiness of God, that God is holy. Then we moved, excuse me, to the fear of the Lord. And today we're talking about a clean heart a clean heart i used to listen to a lot of uh uh, audio sermons i don't have as much time anymore and i find that they affect how i talk a little too much so i don't listen to too many other messages anymore but i used to listen a lot to leonard ravenhill and he told about one evangelistic meeting he was at and the preacher came out he's like after the service powerful revival kind of style service like okay everybody let's let's come to the front for prayer If you want power, I want you to go over to the left. You want some power, overcome something in your life. You want God's empowerment in your work or whatever. I want you to go over to the left. And if you want purity, cleanness, in your relationship with God, I I want you to go over to the right. And Leonard Ravenhill said the line for power went out to like the end of the sanctuary. But the line for purity was just like a handful, (laughs) just a handful of souls. And when we think of purity and cleanness towards God, I don't think it's a very attractive topic. I don't think it's one we want to think a lot about. But as the prophet says, the Lord will search Jerusalem with lamps. And as Jesus Christ himself says, nothing is hidden except to be revealed. I had this thought when I was in the shower just last time. You know, I was thinking to myself, you know, we, we do bad things because we think nobody sees. We think there actually exist secrets in this world we think things can actually be hidden but there is no secrets god sees everything and he will reveal everything at the judgment presumably and there's going to be a lot of people (laughs) a lot of folks around to witness that judgment there are no secrets we can't deceive ourselves into thinking we can get away living a christian life without a clean heart We cannot just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And doing comes from steadfastness. It comes comes from faithfulness. And faithfulness stays faithful because the heart is clean. 
There is a faithfulness that says, I'm going to stick with you because that's the right thing to do. And then there's a faithfulness that says, I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to stick with you. And that's it. No qualification. That's a clean heart. When we do not qualify anything in our relationship with God. We're going to look at a very powerful passage this morning. If you have your Bible, I want you to take a look there. It's in Psalm 51. It also touches the life of David, the man of God whose relationship with God is a fantastic example for us. Psalm 51, I think, is a very famous passage. And it's uh, it's found in well, the Old Testament, if you're flipping through, and it's about one-third of the way through the book of Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. And Psalm 51 is when David is confessing his sin and his broken relationship to God. And he wants it restored. We're going to read the first 10 verses, but really verse 10. Verse 10 is what I want to talk about, a clean heart. Let's take a look here. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 10, the English Standard Version. I'm going to read the little preface there. Create in me a clean heart, O God. That's the title the editors of the ESV have given us. To the choir master, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Now, this episode is when David, he went out. He stayed home from war. He went out on his roof. He was relaxing and he saw a woman bathing. And then he fell in love with this woman. He he lusted for this woman, if we prefer the term. And long story short, he took her to himself. He committed adultery with her. She was a married woman. And he wanted to conceal the fact because she became pregnant. And when her husband came home, he called the husband and tried to kind of convince the man to sleep with his wife so that it wouldn't look like she had an affair or anything like that. He didn't want it to come out. And then, long story short again, Uriah, who was the husband, he, he was a noble man of good character. And he said, how, how can I go into my wife and relax while there's a war going on, David? My brothers in arms are in the field fighting for their lives, leaving their families at home. I know you want to be kind to me and send me home and give me a break. But in good conscience, I just can't do that. And so eventually David felt he was left with no choice but to kill Uriah to cover the matter and then marry his wife. And that's what he did. He killed Uriah, he covered the matter, and he married the wife. That's what he did. And then here's what happened. Nathan the prophet came and revealed to David, nothing can be hidden. You think it was in secret, but it's not in secret. There are no secrets. It's not in secret, David. That's what Nathan revealed. And David, in his brokenness, in the realization of his sin, his cold-heartedness, he prayed this to the Lord. That's the occasion this title gives us. He he prayed this to the Lord. So how about we we read the actual psalm itself, now that we understand where it sits in the Bible picture. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, You delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Would you pray with me this morning? Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Almighty and holy God, whom none can compare to, we invite thee into this message, into this sermon, that you'd be upon me, you'd anoint me to speak clearly, truthfully, accurately, precisely, and you'd be upon your people as they listen. We praise you, O God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now in this passage, we see David, he says this prayer after his sin in Psalm 51 verse 10. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right or a steadfast spirit within me. Renew it within me. David's relationship with God was broken because of his sin, because of his impurity, 
because of his uncleanness. That's, that's the analogies that are used. He needed some soap. He needed some detergent to wash away that sin from his life. And without that being washed away, he felt the presence of God was out of his life. That he was separated from God. That his relationship with God had come to a halt. And he wanted to build that broken relationship again. And no matter where we are, if we're just starting out, or if we have sin we need to turn from, building our relationship with God, the foundation is a clean heart. We have three points this morning. David prays for a clean heart to renew his relationship with God. It's that simple. But how about we put it this way? What is a clean heart? What is a clean heart? A clean heart is the heart of a child. A heart that trusts without condition. A heart that hopes all things. A heart that believes all things. A heart that is full of faith without any strings attached on our end. That's why Jesus, when he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he says, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For to such as these, the kingdom of heaven belongs. Those who have innocency in their hearts, who have pure hearts without a clean heart, It is impossible to have fellowship with God. A clean heart is kind of a tricky thing, though, to lay our fingers on in practical terms. We can understand it, maybe with these analogies and abstractly. But what is a clean heart? How can we have a clean heart towards God? What does that really look like? And this really reminds me of of an episode in one of my classes in university. And uh, we were talking about learning Greek learning another language. Now, it wasn't actually in the Greek class, so I, I won't say who it was, but we were in this class, right? And we were talking about learning Greek, and the professor related the story of a student. And he said this student, this student was very studious to a degree. She studied a fair bit, and she prayed a lot for God to help her in her learning of Greek. He, she, we'll, we'll just use she for the, for the sake of telling the story. And as she was praying for this learning of her Greek, she also mobilized her, her spouse, her, her parents, her church. She mobilized a whole cadre of people to pray for the Greek, for the learning, for the studying. And devoted many hours to praying compared to the hours that were used for studying. And the professor remarked that, well, you see, as a Christian... We need, to have a, we need to have a bit of a common sense. It, we cannot neglect the studying for the praying. We can't do that. And I'm going to disagree. I'm going to disagree because that person trusted in God unconditionally. That God, in fact, truly could completely and totally intervene and help with something that the world tells you needs hard work and hard work only. That person trusted and believed. And I don't know what their grade is. I don't know how it ended up. I know they didn't do the the super greatest. I know generally. But we don't know how it would have been otherwise. Without all that prayer. And I I then relate a story of myself. Because maybe this, this kind of gets people a little. We have, I think, too practical of a faith. We have a clever faith. We have an adult faith. Oh, God is, God's going to help you if you help yourself. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. But, but you make sure you do X, Y, Z. And yeah, of course there's deeds in the kingdom of God, but there is no thinking of deeds in the kingdom of God. There is no deeds when it comes to, there's no strings to faith. Let me give you an illustration from my own life now in the same category. I have kind of the opposite experience of what this professor was talking about. And I've told this, I think, a number of times. There was a particular test, a philosophy test, that I had not studied for and had wasted an inordinate amount of time watching TV instead of studying for, etc., etc., etc. And I'd, I'd come to the final hour. It was past midnight. It was like two in the morning. The exam was like at 10 o'clock. And I had to, I really had to get down and, and, and study. And I was just felt so bad. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. I'm so sorry, Lord. I can't believe I wasted my time. I can't, I can't believe I did that. I felt so, so enslaved, so entrapped. I just felt, oh man. How can I get it? I just said, Lord, could you please help me study? Help me study. I don't have time. And so from that time, I looked at the sheet and there were all these sample questions. And the Lord put in my heart these three. And I took three out of like the 20 some that were on the sheet. I took those three and I only studied those three. 
I focused on them. I only studied them. I didn't sleep. I only studied them. I didn't give up. When I was on the subway, I brought my books. I was reading as I was going. I was focusing, concentrating. I went to school. I, did, I just focused because I repented. I changed my ways. I focused completely on that. And I believe the Lord revealed those three to me. And I studied those three test questions. Then when I went into the exam, the exam had three essay questions. And it was on those three things I had studied. And I got a, I got a pretty high score. <laughs> I got a pretty high score. Let me tell you another one. It wasn't a one-time event. I had a Hebrew exam. And, you know, same story. I didn't study it quite as much as I did. I was more diligent this time, though. And I, I felt like I wanted to be extra prepared for this one. I was, I was pretty okay. But I, my scheduling wasn't very good. And so the day before the exam, I had studied a lot. And I was feeling still not 100%. I wanted to go over some verb paradigms and things like this for learning Hebrew. And so uh, I, I made a resolution. I believed the exam was at 1 o'clock p.m. That's about when our class was. And I was like, okay, I'm going to show up early. I'm going to show up bright and early at like, at like 10 o'clock at the school. I'm just going to study for a couple hours before the exam. It's going to focus. So I woke up, I studied, I read Bible, I prayed, etc. And I go on my way to school. And as I'm on my way to school, I was walking down to go to the street to where my school was. One of my classmates comes out. And I'm like, man, I'm not a diligent studier. This, this guy's coming out. He's, he's, he's been here since who knows how long studying. I'm like, man. And I was like, hey, hey, Bob. We'll just call him Bob. How, how was it? How was it? How was the studying? He's like, Joe. Yeah. What are you talking about? The exam starts at 10. I was like, what? <laughs> the exam starts at 10? <laughs> so I went to school. I was late for the exam, but I finished the test. I answered every question. And again, I got a high score. I got a really high score that time, actually. What's the moral of this story? When you trust in the Lord, when you acknowledge him in all your ways, he helps you. Karma is a world system. This belief that as I do, so it is done to me, that the good get the good and the bad get the bad, such is not the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And someone who has a heart of a child can exploit the mercy and the love of God limitlessly. That's the lesson. You cannot put strings on what God does. And you can have no regrets on what he does. I told you the good stories, but there are tests I prayed for that I studied hard for, that I did not do well on. Why didn't God help me in that one versus he helped me in this other one? Why did he help me there, but he didn't help me here? That's not the question a child would ask. A child accepts. That was a mercy this time. The Lord gave me a mercy. The time he left me to my devices to test me, to find me out. And I accept both. I accept both equally. I love the discipline. I love the chastisement. I love the rebuke of the Lord, and I love the mercy of the Lord. Clean heart. Clean heart. I'll take whatever you give me, God, because I love you and you're my heavenly Father. I trust you unconditionally, whether the prayer is granted or not. It does not hurt me either way, and yet I'm casting myself completely at your feet, desperately begging you to help me, and completely satisfied with what you're going to do in my life. These are little analogies. Maybe we're not dealing with tests anymore or that kind of thing. You can pick any life situation. If you look at it and say, well, I can solve it with my mind. I can figure out the ways of God. You can't. You have no idea the limitless nature of his mercy. And a pure heart looks at God and recognizes the absolutely merciful character of God that if I ask him for help, he's going to help me. And if he doesn't help me, he'll help me through not helping me. No matter what I do, I'm never a loser. When I cast myself at the feet of God, I'm always a winner. I'm always blessed. We cannot have a, a, a cynical, a real, quote-unquote realistic, logical mind frame when we're dealing with God. And I don't mean that we behave irrationally or do, or do totally wild things, but you cannot put God in your box or in your system. You do not understand it. He is the holy God who is to be feared. But he is so loving and merciful up to the death of his only son. So when it comes to God and when we approach him in prayer, so often people have other thoughts in their mind. What I can get, what I've done, how bad or how good I am, how worthy I am to receive things from God. This is not how a child thinks. This is how an adult thinks. 
When my children get in trouble, they'll ask me for something in the middle of trouble, after trouble, during trouble, through the trouble, always asking me for something. Whether in trouble or not, the heart of a child is always willing to cry out to their parent for help, even when they're being punished for something they shouldn't do. They still are always willing to cry out. For help, it's an adorable thing. You know, I sit down with my kids, I'm talking with them. I'm like, Luke, you shouldn't steal your sister's toys. <laughs> this actually happens relatively for You should not steal your sister's toys. He says, Papa hug. Luke, listen to me. You're not so... Papa hug. Luke, Luke, son, you're in trouble right now. Papa hug. Okay. Fine. Papa will hug you. But you still aren't supposed to steal your sister's toys. Do you realize that when you come to God, you come into the merciful, almighty, holy God who is to be feared, and His love outweighs any other characteristic, and His mercy is to the thousandth generation. When we come to God, don't come with strings in your heart or doubt that He is able to grant, because the Lord is able to give more than you ever could imagine, and His willingness cannot be measured on a human scale, because it was up to His only Son. And it wasn't for the righteous that Jesus died, but for the sinners. So how dare we approach the holy God thinking we can merit an answer to our prayers because we did good today, did good yesterday, or X, Y, Z. We have no merit of our own, but we stand because of the cross. And this truth, this simple truth of casting yourself on God from a clean heart is a very confusing and challenging truth. Because, as Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is point number two. Point number one, without a clean heart, it's impossible to have fellowship with God. We need that clean heart, otherwise you're not going to cast yourself on it. But, But number two is, without a clean heart, it's impossible to see God. People put God in their own image. People often think God is not willing to forgive the wicked. They believe God delights in punishment. To many people's surprise, there's explicit verses in scriptures in Ezekiel 18, for example, in the latter half of the chapter. It says that God does not delight in the death of anyone. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. He has no pleasure in the failures of human beings. Rather that we should turn from our ways and live. People have these ideas of God because they don't have pure hearts. They see God as they see themselves. They don't realize that God is a merciful, loving, kind, and tender-hearted Father. And if you cast yourself on Him, you're going to be amazed at what He's going to do in your life. And if you don't get weary of casting yourself on Him, He's not going to get tired of helping you. But you got to have no strings, humbly, innocently going to Him, Lord, I repent, change me. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, why? Because I miss you. I just want you in my life. I want that Papa hug. You know, as my son says to me. He knows he's in trouble. He knows this. He knows that. But he just wants to be with me. And we as children to our Heavenly Father, we should be wanting the Lord's comfort, His presence, and be willing to give anything for that. Just to have Him speak to us and to work in us. A clean heart. So often we have strings and conditions when we deal with God. Our heart is not pure. And so then we're not going to be able to see Him or to discern His ways. We won't be able to see Him or to discern His ways. And that's a very challenging, challenging thing to realize. So then we ask the question, how can this clean heart be created? If without a clean heart we can't see God, we can't perceive Him. We can't understand Him. And then if without a clean heart, then we cannot build our relationship with God. How do we have a clean heart? What can wash us whiter than snow? And there's only one thing. The blood of the Lamb. In the book of Revelation, the saints who have white robes, robes that are white, clean, not filthy, not dirty, there's no sin there, clean. Why? Because they've been washed. In the blood of the Lamb. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let me give you a practical teaching with this. 
that's kind of some abstract stuff we've been talking about. Let me give you a practical teaching that you can put yourself on. Whenever you need God's help, whenever you need a clean heart restored to you, you plead the blood of the Lamb. David prayed for soap, the soap that could wash his soul clean. There is one soap that washes the soul clean. It is the blood of the Lamb. So if when you are in sin, when you are in temptation, when you are in separation, when you feel you do not see God, your heart is not pure. You plead the blood of the Lamb. And He will create a clean heart within you. And He will renew a right spirit within you. The blood of the Lamb. We do not pray the blood of the Lamb into our life enough. I mean, in this COVID time, I mean, think about it. We, 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 COVID's everywhere. That's how we feel anyways, for sure. I mean, you can't see it as microbial. But like, we got to wash our hands. We got to sanitize whenever we enter a building. We wear a mask. And we don't see the enemy that everyone is telling us we are fighting. But we wash our hands. We do etc. And even before COVID for germs. I mean, I never really saw the germs in my hands. But I wash my hands in all these things. Before you eat, before you do things like that, you wash your hands, you clean yourself. How often do we clean our souls? Do we realize that you need a soap to clean the soul? Do we realize there's only one soap, there's only one detergent that can both expunge and atone for all our error and our sin and create clean hands and a clean heart? Because once you make a mistake, it's dirty. And unless you wash it, it it doesn't get clean. So we are all shaped in iniquity. We are born of Adam. We are born into death. The wages of sin is death. Sin is in our line. And the only way to be washed from that is the blood of the Lamb. Jesus on the cross, He paid the price for sin. And then He provided a detergent sufficient to expunge every stain from every soul. And we need to apply that to our life. We get a big washing. We get a new fresh washing when we believe in Christ. When we come to that faith, the blood of the Lamb is applied to our heart. But then as we go through the world, our garment can get stained by the flesh. That's a biblical term. Our garment can get stained by the flesh. And we need to wash those ropes in the blood of the Lamb. We need to reapply. We need to pray the blood of the Lamb, actively, every day, before we pray, all the time in our lives to make us clean. That's a practical point for you. And this comes now to our communion reflection. Let me just say those three. Without a clean heart, it's impossible to have fellowship with God. Without a clean heart, it's impossible to conceive of God, to see Him, to perceive Him. The only way to get a clean heart is through the blood of the Lamb shed on the cross. There's no other way. There's no other lie. There's no other soap. There's no other detergent. There's no other hyssop. There's only the blood of the Lamb and the blood that poured from the crown of thorns and from the nails. There's only the blood of the Lamb that can wash the soul clean. And if you do not pray asking for that blood to be yours, you are not clean. You're not clean. You need it. You need it in your life. This comes to my final point, this clean heart and childlike faith and trust in God. This is now our communion reflection. Uh, For our communion reflection, I'd I'd like you to come with me. I'd like you to go with me here into the Gospel of John. If you have your Bible, you can go there here with me. We'll go towards the end here of the Gospel of John. Oh, I have it bookmarked here. That's very nice. Very nice. John 19, verse 30. This is our communion reflection passage this morning. John chapter 19, verse 30. The English Standard Version. I want you to hear this here right now. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Tell Telestai. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Let me tell you something. The reason why childlike faith has no strings attached when it comes to God and believes it can ask anything of God at any time in any situation and is not super concerned even with maybe getting it, but just with the asking is because childlike faith recognizes 
There is nothing I can do. There is nothing I can earn. I have no status. I have no merit. Jesus said, it is finished. My sin today was dealt with on the cross 2,000 years ago. My heart and my flesh, my feelings, all that I am was paid for 2,000 years ago. When I come to pray, that which enables me to pray, that which washes me clean was accomplished 2,000 years ago. When I come before God, I have the merit of the Son of God applied to my heart. There is nothing more I could need or do to get a higher status with God. My status with God depends not on my works, depends not on my deeds, depends on the blood. And when I put faith in the blood and I trust it with childlike faith, I come to God in innocence knowing I can ask him anything because Jesus died for me and set me free and he cleaned me white as snow. And when you come to God with that realization, that's the clean heart. That's what sets you free. That God will do anything for you because he gave you his son. He will wash you clean. He will hear you. And if you don't get what you ask for, it's not because there's any deficit or any lack. It's not because the cross failed. It's because there's another purpose. And in our childlike faith, we're going to accept that. We're going to accept that because we believe the cross unconditionally. Unconditionally. So at this time of communion, I want us to ask God to create in us a clean heart, trusting only in the cross. Not in our wisdom, not in our intellect, not in our minds, not with any strings attached, believing that by prayer we can receive that which we ask for through faith in the blood. We are washed and are right with Almighty God and that there's nothing more you can do to have friendship with God than to trust Him with a clean heart. Create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew a right spirit that is steadfast within me. Would you take a moment of quietness and reflection? I'm going to go get my communion emblem. You may do so as well. When I come back, we'll take communion reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Why don't you take a moment to pray now and ask Jesus to wash you clean by his blood. Amen. Would you just pray with me, friends, before we receive this? Lord Jesus, we thank you that it is finished. There is nothing more than the cross for anyone who believes. There is no higher state. There is no deeper merit. There is nothing we can earn apart from what Jesus has earned. Increase our faith, Lord, that we may say to that mountain, Be ye moved. That we may say to the mulberry tree, Be ye uprooted and cast into the sea. Help us, O God, to have faith that as far as the east is from the west, so far our sins are removed from us and we stand in right relationship with you as children of God. Would you clean us by the blood of the Lamb and wash us of our sin and forgive us and help us to live in righteousness and holiness before you all the days of our lives. May we never grow weary of pleading the blood in our lives. We thank you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Thank you, Lord, for this body. Do this in remembrance of me. Holy God, would you be with us as we partake of this bread? Bless it to our bodies. Would you partake of this bread in the name of Jesus? In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Thank you, Lord, for this cup of your blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, would you bless this cup to us? How about you partake it with me this morning? Thank you, God.
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Would you pray with me this morning? Almighty God, we come before thee knowing, O Lord, that we have sinned. And we ask that by thy grace, by thy mercy, by thy cross, on that Golgotha hill, that you would forgive us, O Lord Jesus. That you would touch us, strengthen us, and sustain us, and bless us, O God, in Jesus' name. We invite you into our lives, into our heart, that if we are not believers, that we would confess to thee, O Lord Jesus, that you would forgive us of our sins and wash us clean. And if we are believers, that by thy blood, Jesus, we would rededicate our lives to thee. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 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 Praise you, God. Praise you, God. You know, it's an amazing thing. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. What separated the Pharisees from the disciples? The Pharisees, they looked at Jesus and they saw a man from Galilee. The disciples, they looked at Jesus and they saw the man from Galilee, the Son of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for thou shalt see God. We need clean hearts to approach God. Jesus is not a man from Galilee. He's the man from Galilee. There is none like him. Our foundation in our relationship with the Holy God is Jesus. Jesus. See him more and more every day in your life, my friends. And oh God, create a clean heart within me. Would you receive our benediction this morning? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Take care, my friends. You have a fantastic week. Go in the peace and the love of God. God bless.